Good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this sixth day of February, day number 37 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter. I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, someone who shows up with you every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the Bible. We're going to let the Bible do what the Bible does, my friend, and direct our hearts to the one who is the living Word of God, the one alone who has the words of life. And so we come to warm ourselves in the fires of God's presence and love. I'm glad you're here, my friends. We are about to embark upon a new journey today. We are starting a new book. In fact, the next few books are going to be a unique challenge for all of us. Having read through them too many times to count, I can say that it is a challenge. No matter how many times you've read it, But this is something we can do together, and in fact, it is something that we can derive benefit from. Because it, like all of the scripture, is doing something important. And so we're going to let it do what it does, and today that's going to be in the book of Leviticus. That's right, you heard me. (laughs) Put on your seatbelts, my friends. We are in for an adventure. Leviticus 1 through 3 are the chapters we have today, and then on to the book of Acts, chapter 13. Father, thank you for this new book. Thank you for this new opportunity to to see, to learn, to listen, to question, to be amazed. Leviticus, chapter 1. The Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle and said to him, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you may take it from your herd of cattle or your flock of sheep and goats. If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the herd, it must be a male with no defects. Bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle so you may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head, and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with him. Then slaughter the young bull in the Lord's presence, and Aaron's sons, the priest, will present the animal's blood by splattering it against all sides of the altar that stands in the entrance of the tabernacle. Then skin the animal and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, will build a wood fire on the altar. They will arrange the pieces of the offering, including the head and fat, on the wood burning on the altar. But the internal organs and the legs must first be washed with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the flock, it may be either a sheep or a goat, but it must be a male with no defects. Slaughter the animal on the side of the altar in the Lord's presence, and Aaron's sons, the priests, will splatter its blood against all sides of the altar. Then cut the animal in pieces and the priest will arrange the pieces of the offering, including the head and fat, on the wood burning on the altar. But the internal organs and the legs must first be washed with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If you present a bird as a burnt offering to the Lord, choose either a turtle dove or a young pigeon, The priest will take the bird to the altar, wring off its head, and burn it on the altar. But first he must drain its blood against the side of the altar. The priest must also remove the crop and the feathers and throw them in the ashes on the east side of the altar. Then, grasping the bird by its wings, the priest will tear the bird open, but without tearing it apart. Then he will burn it as a burnt offering on the wood burning on the altar. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Leviticus 2. When you present grain as an offering to the Lord, the offering must consist of choice flour. You are to pour olive oil on it, sprinkle it with frankincense, and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. The priest will scoop out a handful of the flour, moisten it with oil together with all the frankincense, and burn the representative portion on the altar. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering will then be given to Aaron and his sons. This offering will be considered a most holy part of the special gifts presented to the Lord. If your offering is a grain offering baked in an oven, 
It must be made of choice flour, but without any yeast. It may be presented in the form of thin cakes mixed with olive oil or wafers spread with olive oil. If your grain offering is cooked on a griddle, it must be made of choice flour mixed with olive oil, but without any yeast. Break it in pieces and pour olive oil on it, if it is a grain offering. If your grain offering is prepared in a pan, it must be made of choice flour and olive oil. No matter how a grain offering for the Lord has been prepared, bring it to the priests who will present it at the altar. The priest will take a representative portion of the grain offering and burn it on the altar. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering will then be given to Aaron and his sons as their food. This offering will be considered a most holy part of the special gifts presented to the Lord. Do not use yeast in preparing any of the grain offerings you present to the Lord, because no yeast or honey may be burned as a special gift presented to the Lord. You may add yeast and honey to an offering for the first crops of your harvest, but these must never be offered on the altar as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Season all your grain offerings with salt to remind you of God's eternal covenant. Never forget to add salt to your grain offerings. If you present a grain offering to the Lord from the first portion of your harvest, bring fresh grain that is coarsely ground and roasted on fire. Put olive oil on this grain and sprinkle it with frankincense. The priest will take a representative portion of the grain, moistened with oil, together with all the frankincense, and burn it as a special gift presented to the Lord. Leviticus 3 If you present an animal from the herd as a peace offering to the Lord, it may be a male or a female, but it must have no defects. Lay your hand on the animal's head and slaughter it at the entrance of the tabernacle. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, will splatter its blood against all sides of the altar. The priest must present part of this peace offering as a special gift to the Lord. This includes all the fat around the internal organs, the two kidneys and the fat around them near the loins, and the long lobe of the liver. These must be removed from the kidneys and Aaron's sons will burn them on top of the burnt offering on the wood burning on the altar. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If you present an animal from the flock as a peace offering to the Lord, it may be a male or a female, but it must have no defects. If you present a sheep as your offering, bring it to the Lord. Lay your hand on its head and slaughter it in front of the tabernacle. Aaron's sons will then splatter the sheep's blood against all sides of the altar, the priest must present the fat of this peace offering as a special gift to the Lord. This includes the fat of the broad tail cut off near the backbone, all the fat around the internal organs, the two kidneys and the fat around them near the loins, and the long lobe of the liver. These must be removed with the kidneys, and the priest will burn them on the altar. It is a special gift of food presented to the Lord. If you present a goat as your offering, bring it to the Lord, lay your hand on its head, and slaughter it in front of the tabernacle. Aaron's sons will then splatter the goat's blood against all sides of the altar. The priest must present part of this offering as a special gift to the Lord. This includes all the fat around the internal organs, the two kidneys, and the fat around them near the loins, and the long lobe of the liver. These must be removed with the kidneys, and the priest will burn them on the altar. This is a special gift of food, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. All the fat belongs to the Lord. You must never eat any fat or blood. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live. Acts 13 Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Menaean, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. One day as these men were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them, and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia, and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogue and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. 
Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. Then he said, You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia. Landing at the port town of Perga, there John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for the services. After the usual reading from the books of Moses and the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. So Paul stood, lifted his hand to quiet them, and started to speak. Men of Israel, he said, and you God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. The God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. Then with a powerful arm, he led them out of their slavery. He put up with them through forty years of wandering in the wilderness. Then he destroyed seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to Israel as an inheritance. All this took about four hundred and fifty years. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people begged for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for forty years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And it is one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised Savior of Israel. Before he came, John the Baptist preached that all the people of Israel needed to repent of their sins and turn to God and be baptized. As John was finishing his ministry, he asked, Do you think I'm the Messiah? No, I am not. But he is coming soon, and I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the sandals of his feet. Brothers, you sons of Abraham, and also you God-fearing Gentiles, this message of salvation has been sent to us. The people in Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus as the one the prophets had spoken about. Instead, they condemned him, and in doing this, they fulfilled the prophets' words that are read every Sabbath. They found no legal reason to execute him, but they asked Pilate to have him killed anyway. When they had done all that the prophecy said about him, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and over a period of many days he appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people of Israel. And now we are here to bring you this good news, the promise was made to our ancestors, and God has fulfilled it for us, their descendants, by raising Jesus. This is what the second psalm says about Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. For God had promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I will give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. Another psalm explains it more fully. You will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. This is not a reference to David, for after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. No, it was a reference to someone else, someone whom God raised and whose body did not decay. Brothers, listen. 
We are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do. Be careful. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you. For they said, Look, you mockers, be amazed and die. For I am doing something in your own day, something you would not believe, even if someone told you about it. As Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. The following week, almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. But when some of the Jews saw the crowds, they were jealous. So they slandered Paul and argued against whatever he said. Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, It was necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews. But since you have rejected it and judged yourself unworthy of eternal life, we will offer it to the Gentiles. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and thanked the Lord for this message, and all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. So the Lord's message spread throughout the region. Then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and the leaders of the city, and they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. So they shook the dust from their feet as a sign of rejection and went to the town of Iconium. And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now may our Lord, who fills us with joy and gives us his Holy Spirit, may he now give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Wherever the gospel is preached, it'll either be received and welcomed or rejected and resisted. For some, it'll seem familiar and old, and for others, it'll seem brand new. Paul and Barnabas were being sent out, and the message about Christ is multiplying in the hearts of many. They are preaching to Jews primarily, and they're taking them all the way back to Abraham and Moses. They took them back through the exile and their deliverance from Egypt. They took them back to the wilderness and the institution of the Levitical and sacrificial system, back through the prophets and the kings. They took them back to something old and familiar. Out of this, the story of God's people, emerged God's man, the Messiah. God's man and his plan is Jesus, the one who would make the world right again. God sent his son to give his life on behalf of the whole world. In his life, lived in perfect love, he fulfilled the law of God. He demonstrated absolute purity, holiness, righteousness, and justice. And then he died on a cross as a substitute sacrifice for us so that we might live. But he didn't just die for all, he was raised to new life for all. And now everyone can be freed from the penalty of sin and shame, from death and the grave, Now every human being can begin to walk in the new life given to them in Christ. This is the message they're preaching with all their heart and soul. And many are responding with joy, but many are resisting and rejecting this message. They resist because they had put their hope in their own piety and obedience to the law and not in God. But it's not only the pious who have a hard time with this. Christians have a hard time with this. Christians everywhere are trusting in their own piety, their own self-effort, as a way to make themselves right with God. And in the end, we end up being frustrated, bitter, exhausted, and discouraged. It happens all the time. But this is not the message that we have been given. The message Paul was on fire to tell was that we are made right with God, not by our own efforts or piety, but by what Christ has done for us. Ours is to believe, to say yes to what God has already done, and to walk in the power, the goodness, the joy, and the abiding presence of Christ himself. Live 
in the light, strength, and joy of Christ in you. Be one who receives and rests in his life, not one who resists and rejects it. That's the prayer that I have for my own soul today. That's a prayer that I have for my family, for my wife and my daughters and my son. And that's a prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Let's continue now in a time of prayer. Feel free to read along with these prayers in the show notes of today's podcast and meditate on these words that are being spoken over you, your family, and our world. And now, let us pray. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to thank you for joining me today in our time in the scriptures and in prayer. My hope is that these practices will bring peace into your life. The peace of God, my friend. Well, hey, friend, before I let you go today, I want to send a shout out to some of our partners. This podcast is brought to you because of people like you who have partnered with us in this ministry. Without partners, it just doesn't happen. But because of folks like Richard Robbins, Bruce Kynes, Megan Melrose, Suzanne McSevick, folks that have joined the team so that we can do this every day. It is teamwork that makes this dream work. Thank you for partnering with us, friends. And if you're listening today and you would like to join that happy group of folks, man, that is so appreciated and it is so needed. And all you need to do is head on over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com. Click on the donate link. That very same link is included in today's show notes. So you can do everything right from your phone, even now. If you're old school and you prefer the U.S. Post, you can reach us at Daily Radio Bible, 2748 Northeast Malini Way, Hillsboro, Oregon, 97124. 
But hey, what do you say we show up again here tomorrow, friend? Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this. That you are loved. No doubt about it. All righty. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care. Bye-bye. Hey, Hunter and Heather. This is Kate from Sydney, Australia. I've been listening to the Daily Radio Bible for years every night, and it is such a blessing to me. 